Hey. <laughs> hey, Osman. Hey, everyone. My name is Carlos. I'm the founder and CEO at Product School. Today, I'm here with another founder and CEO. His name is Osman Kopp, and he works at User Guiding. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Maybe we can start from the top. Why don't you give us the 10, 10 second high level pitch on user guiding? Oh, cool. Uh, user guiding is a product adoption platform. Uh, we help product companies, product people to improve their uh, important uh, metrics like conversion or retention rate. And we are working with almost 1,000 companies from 80 different countries. All right. I like that. Um, I'm sure that wasn't easy and that wasn't quick either. So we're going to explore your journey uh, first. Yeah, yeah. Um, Osman, just uh, so there's like another fun fact is um, you are not based in Silicon Valley, right? Yes, yes. yes I yes. have spent almost uh, two months, uh, two years in Silicon Valley, mostly in San Francisco, but I am in London right now. And, and I love that. I think there is still a misconception around uh, high tech or it has mm -hmm. to be built in, in Silicon Valley. Even now that there obviously there's more flexibility and, and hybrid or remote companies. And, and I love that your, your story and your, your success case and, and how you can build team, you can build a product outside Silicon Valley in this case, uh, London, I know you've traveled around the world, Turkey, Brazil, mm -hmm. and still serve a global audience, including US market. Yeah, 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 yeah. Happy, yeah. To, yeah. happy to talk about it. Uh, Carlos, I remember I tweeted about Silicon Valley. I said that Silicon Valley is not a location, it's a time zone. I think it's all about uh, the shade time zone that uh, you are in touch. Uh, you are in touch with people. Uh, yeah, it was, it was six years ago. And yeah, we were having some uh, tailor-made businesses for other companies with my existing co-founder, current co-founder, Mohamed. Uh, and we were helping entrepreneurs to build their first product. Uh, product. And onboarding was a pain in the ass, uh, but we were not sure how big is the problem. Then uh, we decided to go to San Francisco. It was 2017 to see people, what's going on there. I was in San Francisco for a few times before. Then we noticed that the Onboarding is a common problem for almost every product uh, people we have we have met. Then we checked out the product. We were aware there were a few uh, tools in the market, but yeah, uh, we saw the gap uh, that we can uh, we can gain, and we started to build user guiding in San Francisco. So, so I see you, you started this company in 2018, right? Yes. yes. Before that, now what did you study? What is your background? Yeah, I was yeah. born and raised in Turkey. Um, my my bachelor, my my degree was in uh, business administration. And yeah, Mohammed and I, my co-founder and CTO, we have been very close friends for almost eighteen years. We have studied at the same high school, same university. After university, I started to work as an investment analyst in 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 my university angel investment network. That was a great chance for me to understand fundamentals of entrepreneurship. Uh, since I reviewed more than 3,000 business plans, interviewed with 600 entrepreneurs in this company. Uh, during those days, uh, Mohamed and I, yeah, we have tried a few ideas together, but all of them failed quickly. Then we decided to quit our job and start building our own company. And to save some capital, to understand the uh, ecosystem a, a little bit better, we decided to go, we decided to build a technology service company. We call it Why Not Partners. And yeah, we help um, entrepreneurs to build their minimum viable products uh, and acquiring their first customers. So that first company, was it more of an incubator to, to allow other founders start their own companies? Uh, actually, it was, it, it, it was like a, a startup studio. Uh, we had 11 customers and we built their uh, first products, as I said. And we also helped them to acquire some new customers, uh, help them to raise some money. 
Yeah, I, I think it's like a startup studio or something like that. Yeah, it's a, that I think it's a good good observation. Like, there is, in my opinion, the, the biggest difference between an incubator and a, a studio is that in an in a studio, you are the one who de- decides the idea. You know, starts the yeah. company and brings talent to grow it. While in an incubator, you bring people who, with the idea and then you help them grow. But like, there's a it's, it's like different p- power dynamic and, and risk. Profile. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And it was a lot of fun, Carlos. Actually, I really missed our uh, service business days. I know it was very difficult to scale. They have a lot of issues, yeah, to solve. Uh, but yeah, working with uh, great mind founders every day, trying to help them to solve their problem, owning their problem as your problem, it was a it was, a, it was a great opportunity for, for us to uh, grasp the essentials of entrepreneurship before we start our own business. Totally, and, and, and test multiple things. I mean, I think as an investor, it was probably amazing. You were able to see from the, from the outside, not as an operator, yes. how other people are, are growing and, and get some ideas, learnings. Then as an operator of a portfolio, also test. And then I guess you decided to go all in into one of those companies. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it was it was it was the case, and I also always uh, suggest our freshly graduate uh, friends who is asking some advices from me. Yeah, if you have no uh, solid, robust idea to start uh, building, yeah, you can try to sell some service businesses. Let's let's start with uh, making some SEO for a technology company. Let's start doing some social media uh, consultancy for for other companies, it's also good to understand the, the building company, hiring people, firing people, creating some invoices, um, manage the balance, manage the cash flows. Yeah, it was, it was, it, it was always my advice for uh, um, freshly graduate people. The, the way I put that, and I've seen that a lot in very successful companies is a lot of these successful companies products they started as services first and typically the founders were the product and, and they were able to kind of get enough insights to then try to scale but but there's no replacement for that first interaction for that first service if you will i think it's very risky to go into just building product and thinking about scaling without really testing and, and feeling the pain of the user absolutely absolutely and yeah i, th- I think it's all about iteration carlos i also see Tens of tens of great founders who try to add some service uh, to their products to increase their average revenue per user, increase the uh, lifetime value of the user. Uh, yeah, and, and another common pitfall I've seen in in this in the evolution of these type of businesses is first most product companies actually start as a service, and most of those companies that try to go from service to product fail mostly because their service is actually a service. It shouldn't be productized. Right? Like if you are an agency and you are trying to you know, sell something by the hour, sure, I'm sure there are certain things that you can automate, but, but there are some things that are just very, very hard to automate. And I think that's the magic of, of SaaS product, like software as a service. Like if you can find that opportunity to, to fully automate that solution, so it doesn't require just charging by the hour. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was actually we, uh, we, 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 we were over with our existing clients. If we try to uh, productize what we are serving to our clients, I think yeah, it was it was not applicable for us. We said okay, we try to uh, sell a few projects that we are working on it, and it went well. Then we said goodbye to other clients. Then we went to San Francisco and we said, okay, yeah, we are out of this service business for right now. Then we, uh, we start using building user guiding. So in the case of user guiding, was that an idea that was being created in your studio? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Carlos, uh, as I already shared, actually, onboarding was a, a very, very huge pain in the back, uh, back in the days. Yeah, we were trying to solve uh, using IntroJS, I'm sure you heard of it before. Uh, what was that? We were, 
IntroGS, the open source library for creating some onboarding materials. We were we were trying to find some worker walk around uh, to solve this issue, and there were some beautiful products back in the days. Uh, but Carlos, we were not uh, planning to build the onboarding product before we went to San Francisco because we were not sure how big this problem is. Uh, we, were, we were just thinking about, okay, yeah, it does, it, it's a, a solid problem, but maybe only venture studio pro uh, product people are having that. But in San Francisco, whenever we met some new people, they're always talking about some adoption metrics, some, uh, they're always complaining about their conversion rates, uh, retention rates, and we said, oh my God, yeah, we were, we were trying to solve this issue. Just to clarify, what is onboarding for you? Yeah, um, onboarding in a one sentence, I can talk about it for, for days, uh, of course. Uh, delivering the value proposition in the uh, simplest and quickest way possible. Yeah, uh, that's, that's the main idea about behind user guiding. Yeah, we try to help our clients to make their end users to reach their aha moment more swiftly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yes, so just to add, add to that as so we're talking about software products, obviously most of the, the audience are product managers. They are familiar with this pain. We're talking okay. about once that user signs up or creates mm -hmm. an account, even if that account is free, it, onboarding starts there, right? It's, it's trying to accelerate the path to value so that user continues using the product and doesn't drop off before they get to that aha moment. Yes, yes, Carlos. Actually, let's start from here. Uh, firstly, uh, nobody signs up to your product. Uh, to sign up your product, right? They have some problems, they have some issues to solve, they need some help from you, from your product, from your services. Yeah. And, but you have also a lot of competitors, alternative solutions in the, in, 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 in online, in the world. And you have to deliver your value proposition uh, in, in maybe three, four, maybe 10 minutes. You may, you need to make your end users, ah, yeah, I got it. Yeah, this product will help me to solve these problems in these aspects. Yeah, this is this is the hardest part uh, of our business because Carlos, you remember uh, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, when you download a product from the internet. Yeah, you can spend two, three hours to understand how is how you can use it, how you can get benefit yeah. from it. But right now, you yeah. sign up a product, if you don't understand something, if you can, if that's not clear, okay, just, let's go. Yeah, user guiding alternatives. I can, yeah. I can, I can give 20 alternatives to user guiding. And yeah. that's the same for almost world. every, every yeah, B2B SaaS companies in the world. In the digital world, like nobody wants to read an instructions manual. I like the, the yeah, whole point of onboarding is like, okay, I'm going to give you a shot as a user, but I have a limited tension span. You need to show me value. I need to start experiencing something delightful. So then I want to continue getting more. Um, just, just out of curiosity, want to you know, what are some of these world-class onboarding experiences that you've seen in other digital products? Yeah, uh, it was... I think the first one is uh, Bubble, Bubble.io. Actually, even though they have not, um, they have not uh, renewed their onboarding process for a while, I think uh, their onboarding experience is still uh, one of the best in the world. Uh, yeah, I remember. Yeah, Dropbox, Duolingo. Actually, yeah, Duolingo is also doing a great job on on their uh, mobile app. Slack is doing really good stuff, especially they're always promoting their, uh, their chatbots, their uh, automated work. Yeah, these companies are, are doing real well, uh, in addition so to user guiding, of course. Of course, but let, let's speak maybe Slack, 
it's like a very popular tool for a lot of the PMs. What makes that onboarding so special? Yeah, uh, because, yeah, uh, they're asking some questions when you are signing up to Slack. And yeah, they understand who are you, what kind of purposes we are going to use. And uh, according to your answers, they are personalizing their onboarding process and they are teaching you. And the most important part about Slack's onboarding, they are not pushing you very hard. It's another point about product adoption. Nobody is full uh, anymore. Yeah, you just need to show a few things at one time. You don't need to show everything in the first five minutes uh, after the sign up. Yeah, Slack is doing good because they, they are getting good, uh, good uh, answers before, before when you are signing up to Slack. Second one, they are not uh, pushing you very hard. They are uh, showing a few things at the, every time. And I think they're also doing good this, uh, whenever you start talking to Slack, they are giving some very valuable advice to you. For example, when you try to remind yourself something on Slack, uh, Slash and remind, yeah, their onboarding process is very clean and 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 sweet. Yeah, and as a as a user as well as an absolute product lover who eats onboarding for for breakfast, it's an evolution of this and I've seen over the years. At the very beginning, nobody, very few people cared. Actually, it was all about driving app downloads or email registrations. They the whole mm-hmm. world was like, okay, wait, give me your email, give me your phone number, download. And that used to be associated as a success metric. Obviously, that, that is not like that anymore. And, and we see uh, top companies in the world, especially in social media, uh, talking about daily active users. They're not even talking about monthly active users. They, they are caring about like the people who already Every live day. and are coming back recurrently. And they're coming back mm-hmm. not because those companies are spamming them with push notifications or emails. <laughs> Yeah, and some 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 science to that, but like was most important, they're coming back because they're finding value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the, yeah, that that's the whole point. Yeah, you know, uh, you have you have a lot of problems, Carlos. You don't need to create more problems for your business for your daily agenda. You need you just need to solve your issues, and that's 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 why I'm emphasizing again and again. Yeah, uh, if your product doesn't help. It doesn't, it, nobody cares how beautiful design you have, what kind of messaging, what kind of testimonials do you have in your, in your homepage. And yeah, that's, that, that's why we always focus on this value proposition uh, delivery to end user. What, so as we think about the entire life cycle of, of the user from act, being you joining a product and then being on board with finding value as fast as possible. Why is that step so key? What comes next? What is the actual business impact? Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, the first thing, uh, get the value. And then we just, uh, I, can, I can give some examples from user guiding. Yeah, we just want to uh, create some guides first, then embed our JavaScript tracking code. Then, Carlos, the, the second most important thing, create some habits. I'm sure our audience is, uh, is, is very familiar, much more than me, to create some habits. It's very, very important, yeah. You don't need, you don't want to create some users. They can sign up to your product. Uh, they can sign in your product every quarter. You don't want to create this kind of uh, habits, quarterly habits. Uh, you need to give some uh, ongoing value. Okay, you show your main value, but you 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 need to create some reasons for people to enter your product, if possible, on a daily basis. If not, on a weekly basis. Yeah, Sorry. that's that's why that's why we created survey. Okay, you built your onboarding material, then you just need to. Get some feedback about your new features. You just need to get some feedback about your net promoter score. 
then you need to enter user guiding at least weekly basis to read the answers, export the yeah. answers, share your team metrics. I, I think that's a good point. What the, the success metrics for one company don't always translate to another company. And like maybe in a social network, it makes sense to look at daily active users. But maybe mm-hmm. in a uh, you know, car insurance company, you don't need to come no. back to that <laughs> every single day. Um, the, the other thing that you mentioned that I think is, is enabling more product leaders to start paying attention to onboarding is that now there is technology. There is tools like, like yours that are visual, that are helping people do it. Like before, there wasn't really that much. So uh, teams would need to either create from scratch something that is actually table stakes that, that hopefully now they can use from a SaaS product and, and focus more on their, their specifics instead of trying to build from scratch. But it's also onboarding it's becoming much more complex, right? As, as those products evolve and have multiple features, as you think about not just the new user that joined today, but also maybe a user that was with you for a year. And now if you launch a new feature, you also want to think about the onboarding for that new feature, not just mm-hmm. onboarding for that new, new user. So curious to know about how you think through different types of onboarding, depending on the use cases you are trying to push or the, the customer segment that you are trying to tackle? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, Carlos. Uh, yeah, uh, we are always pushing our survey uh, as, as one of the first steps of our client's onboarding process because uh, you can get some answer uh, from your clients. I'm talking about new user onboarding, but I will jump to uh, new feature onboarding as well the future promotion as well. And yeah, just use survey. Yeah, if somebody is looking for uh, some specific uh, actions, you don't need to show all the stuff. And in user guiding, you can create this kind of connections between your survey results and next step. Uh, Second thing uh, is about uh, feature promotion. And Carlos, as you said, yeah, uh, it's also very important because people uh, become a little bit blind after they enter your product maybe 50 times, 60 times. It's also very important because people are very good at ignoring some, uh, some, some emails, some messages. But if you can uh, reach them, if you can uh, get your attention at the right time uh, when they are doing something uh, wrong or when they are doing something right but they can make it m- more proper way in a more in a proper way that's also very important that's why we always uh pushing segmentation for for our clients if somebody has only one container you don't need to show how to segment their container right because they have only one container but if somebody has 10 container, if somebody has 24 different language in the localization page, you have to show some how to cluster their, their language, their localization settings. Uh, yeah, new feature adoption is important, but uh, you have to be sure it is the right time, it is the right uh, segment of your client. That, that's why it's, become, in my opinion, becoming such a big deal for, for product leaders and there's technology to support that. So even after customer segmentation, you can even get to personalization because now you can see exactly what is each user doing where mm-hmm. they need more help. And it's like, yes, it's good to have some standard templates that will push a certain use case, but not everybody will adopt it at once. And maybe the ones who already adopted can move on to the next level and, and we try to push to ad- adopt another feature while there are some people that still need more care and different ways to, to learn about that. And, and, and I think that is the key of, of onboarding. At the end of the day, it's about really getting users to value as fast as possible and then connecting that with the next steps of this life cycle. Because ultimately, mm-hmm. the goal is to increase revenue. Uh, for those those users, and, and that can only be done if the users love your product. Nobody's going to renew a product that they don't use. Right? Yeah. I always say that you cannot fake an excellent customer experience. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, um, 
people are very busy. They are very busy with your with with their own agenda with Twitter, TikTok, other mm-hmm. social media platforms, news, and yeah, that's why uh, you have to personalize the, your experience because yeah, nobody has one more minute to rest on any yeah. kind of platform. Yeah. And so, how are you thinking about artificial intelligence in terms of helping users with onboarding? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> This is a topic we have been discussed uh, for, for, for a very uh, long time. And yeah, soon we will also take some uh, actions to how we can enable user guiding with other AI solutions. How can we integrate our uh, existing other AI tools with, with, with user guiding? And uh, I think uh, there, there are two aspects. One of them, yeah, they can, uh, AI staff can create some uh, onboarding materials. I think that can be that can be uh, life changing for 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 all of us. And yeah, they can. You just need to have on the one chat uh, chat bar. You can ask any kind of questions, and um, they can. The AI can show how to do that. How to do how to. Uh, connect your data, how to connect your uh, platform, how to connect a- any kind of stuff. I think it will be a very breakthrough uh, for for all of the uh, players in the market. Uh, the second one, I think we can use AI to uh, make our existing products uh, more clever. We, we already discussed segmentation, we already discussed personalization. I think we can we can we can uh, get some value from existing AI solutions <clears throat> to make user guiding or your product more personalized. Uh, more you, you, you remember the um, wording sense and uh, sense and response. Yeah. Your product can sense and they can respond before you, you are even aware, before you are even aware what, what's going to happen. And in terms of your own product, um, what's your vision? How do you see user guiding evolve? Yeah, uh, we are, uh, from the beginning of this year, uh, we, we decided to go with uh, B2B SaaS uh, players uh, because their product usage, retention metrics, conversion metrics, LTV and other critical metrics are much better than the uh, other, other, uh, other clients in, 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 our, in our portfolio. And we, we are planning to go to product adoption platform which BDB SaaS companies can uh, get some feedback about their new features. They can create their uh, feature roadmap prioritization. They can uh, create some new feature adoption materials, okay. promotion materials on user guiding, get some feedback about their existing, uh, existing new features. Uh, and yeah. We will be. We are. We are. We are dreaming about the, the ultimate product adoption platform for BDB SaaS companies, and we are also uh, improving our analytics structure. That's that will be a very important part of our uh, user guiding 2024. Let's talk about adoption versus onboarding. Uh, I heard mm-hmm. you talk about how you want to be uh, ultimate adoption platform. What is the difference between adoption and onboarding? Yeah, uh, onboarding, uh, I think onboarding is a, a sibling of uh, adoption. Adoption uh, serves uh, uh, for bigger purposes. For example, yeah, you can onboard your new users, uh, but in, in, in product adoption, you can also get some uh, feedback about new feature reviews, for example. You can also get some feedback about your latest releases uh in in onboarding you just need to feel people the aha moment in product adoption you have to 
on all critical product metrics, upsell, up, uh, conversion, your one metric that matters, uh, rates, your retention rates, your net dollar retention rate, this kind of all, uh, all critical metrics can be owned by adoption, uh, not, not on the onboarding. Yeah, I've seen that it going from being literally a product to being a platform and supporting multiple use cases. Uh, yeah. I see onboarding as a subset of adoption. One strategic decision that I, I'm sure you are aware I want to ask is how to go about that evolution from product to platform. I see two different trends in general, um, and there are pros and cons. One is building. And saying, okay, we're going to start expanding our own product. We're going to build some of these different use cases. And it's probably going to take longer. It's probably going to be more expensive. But obviously, if it works well, it's just all going to be centralized. Uh, another option that I've seen is uh, integrations uh, with other tools that are covering specific use cases. Mm -hmm. And that gives you speed that uh, is probably less that's F, you know less effort and less money since you are not building every single thing. You are building the integrations. Obviously, uh, you don't. You are not the central player. So, what type of direction are you thinking to take next? Yeah, uh, yeah. We are we are already investing a lot of time to integrate as much as different uh, platforms with user guiding, uh, because there are some platforms you cannot build in in a few years. Yeah, that's why we are integrating user guiding with. Amplitude, mixed panel, hub support, yeah. That there is no way to uh, replace these tools in a few decades, I think so. Uh, yeah, but there are also some uh, some features that we, if we can, if we would build in house, that will be much more meaningful for our clients, uh, for our, uh, and it's also make more sense in the financial outcomes uh, wise. Survey actually, yeah, there there are tens of surveys in the market, but if we could create a native survey, now you know if you could build it, you know that every part of your product you can integrate your whole product, and it is it, it is much more uh, smarter decision for us. Uh, and but I, I I really want to answer your questions. We will we. Will, I don't think so. Yeah, they are substitute. We will invest in integration as much as we can, but we also make some uh, some brave, uh, some bold moves to build some new products mm -hmm. under user guiding umbrella. I think that's part of uh, product leadership. Like you, you as a leader, are making this hard decisions on here's how we're going to grow the business, and there are pros and cons, and it's hard to, it's impossible to please everyone. And in a way, and I know as a founder, it's tempting to go for more, to squeezing one more thing into the next, <laughs> thing, into the next roadmap, right? But I think having the awareness around how we win, how we can double down on what makes you unique and be an easier player to connect with others that are very, very good at other use cases can give you an edge. Uh, at least in the product space, uh, I've seen that evolve. From being from being no space, literally there were no product tools, backing uh, <laughs> off like tools for marketers, tools for designers, and now we have our own set of of tools. Some players are trying to cover everything and be the ultimate platform, but most players are trying to double down on their strengths and make it easy to integrate with others. Yeah, yeah, as you said, yeah, it has some. Uh... Trade-offs and yeah, uh, I'm I'm very excited for for 2024 because they're coming soon. Very 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 great features for user guiding. Uh, yeah, and I think uh, we will be one of the best friends of product people in, in 2024. It's a privilege to build for builders, right? And, um, and absolutely, I, I love having this time to learn from you and 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 your vision. Thank you so much, Osman. Yeah, it was a great chance for me uh, to talk about our feature, our, our, our product and our journey. Thanks for having me again.